Our gut reactions are the sum of all of our experiences and everything we've learned comes out often in an immediate emotional response. Just, that's wrong, that's right, whatever that is. That's the sum of all of your knowledge and understanding. And that's what we should rely on. Think about insurance, what is it? It's a promise to pay. You hand over hard cash in case something goes wrong. And we promise to look after you if something happens. We hope something doesn't, but you need us. I find it uh, hard to answer questions about Everest. Uh, it's uh, because it's iconic, everyone. Uh, I've climbed other mountains, no one wants to talk about those. Uh, and harder ones too. But Everest is, is, the, is the one, so it is quite interesting and I'm, I'm fascinated as to why we're so interested. And it's just human nature, I think, I suppose, for the, being the highest. I have climbed most of my life in different ways and you start to, you, you keep wanting, as I said before about people who are successful, you want to achieve the next thing, achieve the next thing. You get to you, a lot of people get to their sort of early mid-40s You've climbed in the Alps, you've done the rock climbing in your 20s, and like, what's next? And then you start to think about the Himalayas. So that's more what it's like, and maybe I could. So I started exploring it when I was in my mid-40s, and it's just amazing. It's, it's amazing to have done something like that. It does matter more than other mountains in a strange way. I climbed Manaslu first the year before, which is the eighth highest in the world. No one's ever heard of Manaslu. It's, got a, it, it's, it's above 8,000 metres, it's the death zone. It's, there's actually a 25% chance of dying on Manaslu because of avalanche. It's a wet mountain, there's lots of snow. The chance of dying on Everest is 5%. So I'd climbed something that was five times more dangerous than Everest, and yet I had my wobble when I was about to climb Everest. I looked around the, all the grave sites of all the climbers who died, and six people died when I did it in, in my year. One guy dropped dead in front of me as we were climbing the, the Lopsy face, just of a heart attack. But it was because it was Everest, I had to think, do I want to do this and is it worth dying for? And weirdly it was, because you don't really achieve anything massive or big unless you're really going to commit. You have to commit fully. In modern life today, you don't really do that very often. We could all have a get out clause, or I will try something and maybe I can get out. This was one moment in my life where I thought, is it worth everything for? Yeah, just, just because I wanted to. And I'd have died happy. I had no plans to die, but I would have done. In fact, when I got back, my dad said to me, he thought I was going to die because he knew I was never going to give up, which I thought was intriguing. He never told me that before. He only told me when I got back. And I'd like to think that I would have come down if I needed to. And in fact, we had one failed summit attempt. We got up to camp three. So when you're at base camp, you've still got five days of climbing. So a lot of people do the trek to base camp, which is around 18,000 feet. And at that level, you've got half the oxygen of sea level. So most people are, are struggling quite badly and they kind of touch, touch base camp and then go back down. We lived there for two months, at half the level of oxygen. So your oxygen saturation should be near 100% for, to operate normally. We tested ours uh, daily and, and mine was around 60-65 most days. Below 90 in a normal environment, you're in hospital. You, you, you're straight in hospital in an emergency bed because there's something wrong. And we lived at 65%. So that takes its toll on your body. And then you do that for two months and then when the weather breaks you have to go for it. It's five days climb. We climbed for three days, up to camp three, uh, three full hard days, and then the weather changed. And you, everything's done through the base commander at, on base camp, and he said, look, I've got five weather reports here. Three say it's good and two say it's bad. I want you to come down. There's no way we were gonna come down. We, did, we climbed for three days and two months at base camp. I spent two years training for this. We kicked up a stink, but we came down, because that's the rule base commander says you go down you come back down so we came back down spent two days climbing back down 
on the way back down, an avalanche hit. Actually, it was it was it was really close. It was on the on the Kumbu Icefall, where a lot of avalanches happen. And you usually climb it at night because it's a bit more stable. It's like a bunch of ice blocks falling down a hill, but the ice blocks are the size of three-story houses. So you're climbing amongst these things that can move at any time. So you climb it at night when it's when it's cold and it's fairly secure. We were coming down at the end of the day uh, because high up the camps, the food's rubbish. It's all boiling in the bag, uh, and down, down a base camp, you've got proper cooking, so we wanted to get egg and chips. We were going to go down for egg and chips. So we ended up climbing through the Kumbu Icefall late at night, which is a dangerous time. And there were eight of us. We'd had the failed summit attempt, we were a bit pissed off, we wanted to get back, weren't really concentrating, shouldn't really have been there. Four of us were a bit quicker, and then four were a bit slower. I was in the slow group. And it was, it was at night, snowstorm hit, couldn't see anything at night and you started to hear the rumble. And the weirdest thing about avalanches, and I've been close to three or four of them, is you have no idea where they're going to come from. No idea at all. So what do you do? You think, if there's an avalanche coming, you run. So, so you think, avalanche, run. Where? Which way? And, and all that happens is you stand still. It's happened to me every single time. And on this night, in the snowstorm, the same thing happened, a rumble. Massive avalanche come from somewhere, no idea where from. So we were just stood still. And the avalanche hit between the two groups of four climbers. Massive collapse and avalanche in between us, uh, which we got, was about 100 yards away from us is where it hit. And the other guys got hit a bit by it, but they were okay. Uh, and so much devastation, we couldn't get through it. So we actually had to climb back. I'd been climbing for 19 hours that day because it was a failed summit attempt. Coming down, I had to climb back up to one of the higher camps, stay overnight and then come back down the next day. So we had a failed summit attempt, got back down to base camp, absolutely knackered. This is a war of attrition. Your, your body with the, the, the low oxygen levels can't digest food properly. So what you're doing is you're eating your muscles. So you get thinner and thinner. Sounds like a great diet routine, but it's not because the fat stays, just your muscles go. It's not a good look. So you can only have two attempts. So we got back down to base camp. The weather changed. Russell, our base commander, said, right, off you go again next morning. Back up, another five days climbing. But this time the weather stayed good. So we got to camp four, ready for summit day, and we made our summit day. So I was lucky. By the time you get to the South Coal, the camp four, you care about nothing else. You will give your life to climb that mountain. You talk about nothing else, you think about nothing else. It's the only reason you exist is to make that climb. Uh, Summer day was strange. We, you get up about midnight and you get ready at about one or two o'clock in the morning because what you're trying to do is climb through the night when it's safer and get to the top at, at sunrise. Fantastic sunrise, what the best sunrise in the world. We got up at Camp 4 and you, because you're climbing at night you have head torches and you can see the climbers and there were loads of climbers already started. There was a massive Indian uh, uh, um, group of 30 or 40 of them and then another um, uh, Far Eastern lot as well uh, and some Japanese um, and a couple of others and they'd all left really early and got up there and we thought oh no because the problem you've got is there's only one rope and everyone follows the same rope. We quickly caught up with them actually because they're a pretty fit bunch and, and by the time you get to camp four you've whittled down to the people who know what they're doing. We got to the end of this queue and the problem is all we need is one person to struggle on a technical bit and everyone else is waiting. And because you, of the lack of oxygen, you're knackered, every move is hard, you just stand there and wait. So we didn't. We unclipped from the rope and we free climbed up the first bit. I was actually in front, so I led it. And we, we climbed past all these guys on the rope, standing there. And the look on their faces was one of anger. Because, what are you doing? You're supposed to be standing here on the rope waiting. And you're just going climbing straight past me. And how dare you? And aren't you going to die? Because one slip and you're off. But we figured it was worth it. So we climbed past all these large groups, got up onto the shoulder, and as a result of that, we made it, all of us made it, onto the top. 
at sunrise. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. I can show you the pictures. Uh, still minus 40 because you're up high, but it was amazing. It's, there's just nothing like it. And, and, and because the weather was good, we had a chance to just sit there and take it in and take photos. The guys that had gone on the previous attempt, some of the teams decided to carry on on the one we went down. They, they actually climbed in a snowstorm. They got frostbite on their faces, their fingers and their, their toes. They lost fingers and toes. And when they got to the top, couldn't see anything because it was in a storm. So what was the point? So we were really lucky to actually climb it on a beautiful day and have the chance to just take it in. But the thing is, once you've climbed, you start to relax. And 80% of deaths and casualties happen on the way down. So you're only 20% of the way through in terms of risk. So you still have to stay on it uh, and stay controlled. I was feeling pretty good. I was, I was pretty good. I, one of my fingers was frozen, which was a bit weird. Because that, if that stays like that, then that's frostbite. But if you keep moving, the chances are when you go back down again, start moving, and it did. It did in any, I'm still touching the finger it was. I still remember this one. Um, but for quite a few weeks afterwards, I would dream of sitting on the top. I could still imagine it. I kind of knew I was in bed, and I kind of had a duvet around me, but I was sitting on top of Everest, which was weird. But it had that kind of impact on me of just, I'm sitting at the top of the world. And with that comes a real sense of achievement and calmness, which is great. I'd recommend it to anyone who, who wants to do it, just because it is so iconic. There are very few things you can do in the world where you feel really good. You feel like you've definitely achieved something as opposed to, I've got the next day and the next thing and the next project. And, and that's what it's given me, is a, is a, a calmness and a, a kind of a bit more confidence. One of the reasons I climbed it was I wanted to prove to myself that I could. And I think a lot of people that do climb Everest, they're either nutters with big egos, I've done everything else, I'm never going to climb Everest, and they're idiots. Or they're people a bit like me who, who've done some things and succeeded in some ways, but still feel I need to prove myself to myself, to my family, to my friends. And that helped me do that. And I don't have that need so much. I still do some stupid things. I'm a qualified skydiver and a deep sea diver and, and cycled through from north to south Vietnam. And, you know, I, I like doing things like that. I've done sea swimming as well and swam to the Isle of Wight last year. And I'm off to Alaska uh, in the summer next year. So I, I like those kind of things, but there's not the, it's not the need to prove myself, it's just for fun now. And that's what Everest gives you. You know the first thought, I don't know if you know, you've got the Hillary step is the last technical bit before you get to the top. So you get to that and you think, oh shit, Hillary step. And it's kind of steep rocks and it's 29,000 feet high, you know, above sea level and you've been working to that point. I got to the top of that and I realised all I had to do was stumble a few steps to get to the stop. And my thought was, don't fuck it up now. <laughs> That was my thought. So I can probably shouldn't say that, but that was my thought. It's like, you know, you just don't want to mess it up when you get so close. Uh, so it's, it's strange the feelings you have. Another example of that was um, when I was doing Manaslu, we, a lot of crevasses that you cross, you cross with snow bridges, which is a bit of ice that's just stayed there. So most crevasses are 10, 20 foot wide as a snow bridge. Uh, the problem is over time when people use them and it gets warmer as they get a bit get a bit looser. So I was halfway across this crevasse, deep enough that you couldn't see the bottom, about 500 foot deep. And I fell through, straight through, this, the, through the snow bridge, my feet straight through the, the hole. And the only reason I didn't fall down to the bottom of the crevasse is rucksack sticks out. And first thing you do when you fall without expecting it is your arms lift up. So up to my chest, arms here, rucksack caught, was like this. My first thought, did anyone see me? I was embarrassed. It was, oh shit, I shouldn't have, uh, you know, this isn't right. It was my first embarrassment, not I'm going to die. And I looked around, no one saw me, thanks, thank God for that. And then it's like, how the hell do I get out of here in a dignified sort of way? It was really difficult to squirm out of it. And I got out of that and I got to the other side. And then I thought, shit, I could have died. It was only afterwards. We do the weirdest things under pressure. It's really strange when you're near death. 
you're probably thinking about, did anyone see me? Have I embarrassed myself? Do I look okay? It's just weird stuff. Strange. The, the, the thoughts of the risk come later. So uh, I've, I've done the, uh, there are the seven summits. If you heard of the seven summits, that's the highest mountain in every continent. Uh, and I've done the, the hardest and the easiest, just by chance. I've done Kilimanjaro, which is the easiest in Africa, and Everest for Asia. And then the other five summits around the world. So the one in North America is in Alaska. It's called Denali. It used to be called Mount McKinley. It's been changed to its original name formally. Uh, so and I've always, uh, the thing I like about the Seven Summits, you go to some fantastic places. I've never been to Alaska, I'd like to go to Alaska. So I love to explore and I love to push myself, so combine the two.